Well, today I want to start with a little game. Uh, it's a new one. I don't think I've done this one before. It's called Name That City. Uh, I'm going to give you um, a nickname for a well-known city, and then you just holler out the name of the city. And it's pretty easy. You should be able to follow right along. We'll start with an easy one. How about this one? The Windy City, Chicago. How about the Big Apple, New York? City of Angels, Los Angeles. That might be a little misnamed, but the Big Easy, New Orleans. City of Brotherly Love, Philadelphia. The Motor City, Detroit. I picked this picture. It was a little kinder than some of the other pictures I found of Detroit. How about this one? Sin City, Las Vegas. Now, I've never been to Las Vegas. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you have. But from a distance, my impression of Las Vegas is just kind of that, Sin City. 72 casinos filled with nightclubs, bars, all kinds of adult entertainment options. The nickname kind of seems to make sense. But did you know this? I found this on the Internet in looking up information about Las Vegas. This quote. Las Vegas has a dirty little secret that's hiding from many of the 35 million tourists who come out to cut loose in a place where sin is celebrated and sold with messianic zeal. Here's the secret. Brace yourself. Las Vegas has churches. Lots of them. There are actually some 500 churches in the city of Las Vegas, including Central Christian Church, the ninth largest church in America, 21,000 people in worship every weekend. Did you know that? That may come as a surprise to us, but maybe it shouldn't, because the gospel has been doing stuff like that for a very long time. Today we wrap up our series, sort of a mini-series on our big series in the book of Acts called The Tales of Transformation. Let me give you a little summary so far. We are 17 chapters into the great book of Acts, roughly 20 years or so into the life of the church. We're in Paul's second missionary journey. You might recall that in chapter 16, he left um, Asia, the region we call Turkey, and crossed over into Europe, northern Greece, and visited a city called Philippi, where we see the conversion story of Lydia, the seller of purple cloth, and then the story of the Philippian jailer. Remember the guy who was going to take his own life? Paul says, no, we're all here. He becomes a believer. His whole family is baptized. Then we saw Paul move on to Athens, the great city, and debate the leaders there. Jeff covered that last weekend. Now we go to Acts chapter 18. I'm going to begin reading here. And this passage, I have to tell you right up front, sort of frustrated me when I was studying it a couple of weeks ago. Because I just struggled to find the sermon in these 17 verses. Uh, because it's kind of buried. So we're going to go through this almost verse by verse at times. Because I think you'll find that as we uncover the detail, uh, a sermon will sort of emerge from that. So look in your personal Bibles on the screens. Let's dig, dig in. Acts chapter 18, chapter 1. Luke is writing. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. I'm going to stop there just after one verse. Because anyone reading this in the first century, would have immediately understood that Luke was telling them that the gospel had now gone to Sin City. And that's because Corinth is a very unlikely place to take the gospel. Think about it this way. When companies today want to launch a new product, they spend a lot of time and money researching the best places to launch that product because they want to give it the best chance to succeed. You, you don't try to sell surfboards in Colorado or air conditioning in Alaska, you want to find the best place for that product to succeed. And in terms of the gospel, uh, Corinth was not that place. Take a look at the map on the screen. You can see where Corinth was, but this is a map of Paul's second missionary journey. See, he starts over on the right side in the east, uh, Israel, Antioch is up to the north, makes his way all the way through Asia, what we would call Turkey today, crosses over the Aegean Sea into northern Greece, Philippi, then down to Athens, and then finally down 50 more miles south to a city called Corinth. Now, where Athens was the political, intellectual, cultural center of ancient Greece, Corinth was kind of the opposite. Had the reputation of being a rough and seedy place, even by the standards of the ancient world. It was located on a major trade route. There was a port to the east that led to Asia, port to the west that led all the way to Europe and Rome. So there were lots of sailors, lots of merchants, people from all kinds of different religious and cultural backgrounds. And as well, the city was known 
as the home of the great temple of Aphrodite, who was one of the, the ancient pagan goddesses of fertility. You'll see this picture of ancient Corinth. Uh, you're looking past some ruins. There's a hill in back of the city. And on that hill, at one time, in the heyday of the city, there was a temple uh, that housed 1,000 cult prostitutes. And in the evenings, those uh, prostitutes would come down to the city of Corinth to ply their trade. So the very word Corinthian uh, came to be known as uh, people associated with all kinds of debauchery. So Corinth, in a very real way, was sin city. So why would Paul choose Corinth as his next target? Why would he choose a city like that with that reputation uh, to invest his time and energy, a city with no interest in the gospel? Well, I think there are likely three reasons. First, I think he was led by the Holy Spirit. We know from other places in Acts, uh, Paul would have dreams or visions in which God would lead him. And that was the Holy Spirit's leading. For example, remember the, the, the dream with the man from Macedonia said, come over and help us. That was going over to Greece, to Philippi. He had other times when, when God would warn him not to go from certain areas or to withdraw from certain areas. So we can assume, I think, that Paul in his prayer life was constantly asking God, what would you have me to do next? Where would you have me to go? And that God, through the Holy Spirit, had led him to Corinth. But secondly, I think he saw a great need. I think Paul would have known the reputation of this city. And Paul, being Paul, was drawn to sharing the good news, sharing the good news of the gospel with people who were imprisoned, trapped by idolatry and sin. And thirdly, I think Paul saw a great opportunity. Corinth was strategic in its location. Remember, port cities on each side. It was also strategic in terms of the diversity of its population. I think he saw great potential in Corinth to be sort of a launching pad for the gospel to other parts of the world. So Paul saw Sin City as exactly the place where the gospel should go. So I was thinking about that as I read through this text, and I wondered, what is Sin City for us? Do we have to go as far as Las Vegas to find places or people that might need to know the grace of Jesus Christ, the gospel? And I think we probably don't have to go that far. Think of the place where you work, your office, your workplace, maybe the campus where you study, maybe your school, maybe your extended family, maybe your neighborhood, maybe even in your home. There are people who need to know the gospel. So how do we approach Sin City? I think we see three themes throughout the book of Acts. First is prayer. We look for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Where should we go? Who should we talk to? How should we build a relationship? And then we engage we have a conversation. We build a relationship. We offer to care for someone. The gospel always travels across relational bridges to find its home. And thirdly, we extend an invitation. Just invite. We did a survey recently of our congregation, found that of those who are, are, have come to our, this church in the last year, 60% of them responded to a personal invitation. Someone they knew and trusted invited them to join them for some part of of our ministry. So pray, engage, invite. First thing we see here in the first verse is the gospel goes to Sin City. Secondly, we see that the gospel reaches key leaders. Continue to verse 2. And, and he found there a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, we need to take a look at this couple. Uh, by the time we get to Acts 18, Paul is about 20 years or so into his ministry of taking the gospel to the Gentile world. And in that time, he's learned the significance, the importance of building a team for this difficult task. In the first journey, remember, he traveled with Barnabas and a young guy named John Mark. In the second journey, he's traveling with Silas and Timothy, who are going to join him in just a couple of verses. But here he adds two new key members, a dynamic married couple named Aquila and Priscilla. Now, throughout Acts, when Luke writes down names, he does it for a reason. We need to know who this couple is. Uh, they play a, a significant role, not only in Acts, but in the rest of the New Testament. Priscilla is a Roman name. We wouldn't know that unless you did the study because they're just names to us. But a Roman name. Scholars believe she probably came from a very prominent Roman family. Aquila is also a Roman name. However, Luke clearly identifies him as a Jewish man. So we can assume that uh, he was born into a Jewish family, but because they lived in Rome, he was given a Roman name. Now, this makes 
this couple unique because it was very unusual in that time for a Jewish man to be married to a Roman or, or Gentile woman. They were also unique in that it appears that they were followers of Jesus before they met Paul in Corinth. So they became believers in the city of Rome. We'll talk about that in just a moment. They are uniquely suited for Paul's ministry team because they represent both of the major people groups, the Jewish background people and the Gentile background people, and they've already been followers of Jesus in a large, hostile, urban environment, the great city of Rome. Luke tells us they've now come to Corinth, next verse, because Claudius has commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now again, you may not know this, but Claudius is the third Roman emperor to be mentioned in the New Testament. The first was Caesar Augustus at the time of Jesus' birth. Then there was Tiberius Caesar during the time of John the Baptist. Now we see Claudius. And Luke is the one that mentions all of them because Luke has a priority to anchor the story of the gospel, the story of the church in real time and real history. In other words, he's saying, we're not making this stuff up. This is real history happening to real people. And we know now from extra-biblical sources that Claudius ruled Rome from A.D. 41 to 54, exactly the time frame that we're talking about here. It says he commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now what's happening there? It's significant because we now have evidence that, uh, that the gospel had made its way all the way west to Rome by this time. Because what's happening here is uh, we know most of the early believers were Jewish. That is, they were meeting in synagogues. But there were two kinds of Jewish people then. There were those who were uh, strict, strictly Jewish, and there were those who had come to believe Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah. And there was a growing conflict in the synagogues of Rome between these two groups. Now, Claudius didn't understand the religious nature of that conflict. He didn't, wasn't interested in what made the conflict. He just didn't want it to happen because he wanted to keep peace. So he just kicked them all out, or at least tried to. And it's, it's, that's the reason why we believe that, uh, that Aquila and Priscilla were already followers of Jesus by the time they got to Corinth. So they come to Corinth, and Paul seeks them out. Next verse. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now, tent making was a well-known trade in the early, uh, in the first century. People who worked with canvas, they made awnings and tents and sails for boats and so forth. And we know from other places in the New Testament that Paul himself was a maker of tents. And so we use the term today to describe people in ministry who work secular jobs to raise money, to earn money, to support themselves in ministry. Tent makers, that's where it comes from. And this strange little detail tells us how Paul may have met this young couple. It was a workplace relationship. They met plying their trade as tent makers. Luke continues, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with, a better translation might be consumed with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Now evidently, when Paul, uh, uh, Paul left Athens to come to Corinth, but left uh, Timothy and Silas behind in Macedonia. They went on to visit some believers who were being persecuted in Thessalonica. Eventually, they come to join Paul in Corinth. But we see something interesting here. When Paul begins his ministry, he does so, as usual, by going to the synagogue. And it says he reasons every Sabbath with the folks that are there. He starts kind of conservatively for Paul, kind of reserved. But notice, when his friends come and join him, Luke tells us he then is consumed with, occupied with, testifying about Jesus. It's interesting to me that even the Apostle Paul, who we tend to regard as utterly fearless in his faith, seems to be emboldened when his friends come to be with him. There's something we can learn there. Because if Paul needs the strengthening factor of his friends, how much more do we need that? You saw the little video about the all-time bestseller book club, the, t the testimonies of people who find great encouragement reading God's Word, but doing so in community. We need support. We need community. We need to be in and on a team because we gain strength when we're with others. 
Verse 6, And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Here's why Paul needed his friends. They opposed and reviled him. A few months ago, I read um, a very good book called uh, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, written by a, a guy named Dr. Nabil Qureshi. Uh, he tells the story of growing up in a strict Islamic family in the U.S. By the time he was five, he had recited the entire Quran in Arabic. But he tells through a long story how he became disenchanted with his faith and through some loving Christian friends while he was in college, he eventually came to see and accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. As he tells that story, um, he says the most painful part of that whole process was then and is to this day the rejection and disappointment he experienced from his family, particularly his mother and his father. Here we see Paul faced rejection from his own people. They oppose and revile him. Now look at Paul's response. It says he shakes out his garments. Now what does that mean? Well, it's a Jewish expression of separation. He's saying he doesn't even want their dust left on his clothing. So is Paul just giving up on all those who have rejected him? Is he telling us just give up on friends or family who have not yet responded to the gospel? I don't think so. Not quite exactly. I think he's making a final, bold gesture to get their attention because the Jews would have immediately recognized what he was doing because it's what they would do when they left a region inhabited by Gentiles. They would shake off their garments because they didn't want any Gentile dust sticking to them. So Paul is demonstrating to them the importance of what he's trying to do. He's saying, I've shared with you what I came to share. I've shared with you the truth, but now you've got to deal with it on your own. He basically turns them over to wrestle with God in their own hearts. There comes a time when it's simply no longer productive to argue or reason rather to turn someone over and trust God with their hearts. And that's what he does uh, here. Seven. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Now, we've got to stop here just for a bit. I think this is one of the transformational centers of this chapter. Uh, Paul goes to the synagogue, which was his practice, and there he is rejected. But notice, not by all. We see Titius Justus, which is a Roman name, so he was probably a Gentile worshiper of God, worshiping in the synagogue. Uh, he comes to faith. And then this man Crispus, who was called a ruler of the synagogue, which meant one of the religious leaders in the synagogue, comes to faith in Jesus and his entire household, and they're baptized. Even Corinthians are being baptized. Remember what the word Corinthian meant. It meant people associated with all kinds of debauchery because they lived in Sin City. Now, this is a continuation of the theme we see throughout the book of Acts, that is the gospel moving into unlikely places and reaching very unlikely people. And then we see something interesting in verse 9. It says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people." If you think about it, that's a bit confusing. Why this vision now? I mean, things finally seem to be going well. The gospel's taking root. People are being baptized. Even Corinthians are coming to faith. But that's exactly the problem. This has all happened before in previous chapters. What happens right after Gentiles start coming to faith in Jesus? Throughout Paul's journeys, what's happened when things start going well? Things go badly for Paul, right? He's dragged outside the city and stoned and left for dead in one place. He's beaten with sticks and dragged into prison, his legs put in stocks. Paul knows what's coming next, and he dreads, he's apprehensive. Here it comes again, he thinks. Notice the kind of roller coaster ride Paul's been on just in this chapter. He finds Priscilla and Aquila. That's good. He's rejected and reviled in the synagogue. Down. Titus, Artitius, Crispus, and many Corinthians are baptized. That's good. He's up. Paul fears a violent backlash. Down. God comforts him in a vision. Up. Ever felt like that? Like you're on this giant 
roller coaster ride when it comes to your faith. Now, we're not in threat of prison here in our culture. We're not in threat of being beaten or dragged away somewhere. But we knew, know what the roller coaster ride is like sometimes. There are times when we feel very close to God, where everything seems to be just clicking, going well, all across our lives. And then there are other times when it's not that way. We pray and it feels like our prayers just bounce off the ceiling, like no one's listening, and everything is going wrong. I've had lots of conversations like that, one just last night after service. If we look at Paul, we see that he had tremendous successes, miracles. He also had terrible heartbreak, pains, difficulties, some not even his own fault, all the while seeking to serve and follow Jesus with passion and great courage. So what do we learn? It tells us that God does not typically protect us from all disappointments and trials. Rather, he uses those trials to produce good things. Paul learned this in his life, and later in his life, he wrote a letter to the Roman church. In Romans chapter 5, he wrote this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the gospel. We have peace with God. That's a good thing. Salvation. And then he writes, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope. This hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Paul learned and is teaching us that both our successes and our disappointments, our good times and our trials, can be used by God to build character and to bring Him glory. Now, knowing this doesn't make our difficult times any less painful. But it does tell us that they can produce good things when surrendered into His hand. That leads us to the third part of the story, and that is that the gospel gains a foothold. The gospel now gains a foothold. Many historians view the Allied invasion of Normandy to be the key turning point in World War II, at least in Europe. Battle was extremely difficult, extremely costly, but it did give the Allies a foothold in Europe and eventually led to the defeat of the Third Reich Nazi Germany. Luke tells us here that Paul gains a foothold in Corinth. Verse 11, and he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now this is unusual in Paul's journeys. The only other place in all the book of Acts where Paul stayed longer was Ephesus, we're going to be there in a couple of weeks. Here he stays in Corinth for a year and a half, building a church in a very unlikely city. It's interesting to note that although he was in other cities, we don't have letters in your New Testament, for example, to the church in Athens. We don't. We have two letters written to the church in Corinth. They're called First and Second Corinthians because Paul spent 18 months gaining a foothold in that city. Now we come to a very interesting part of the story. It's very easy to miss these verses, just to sort of blip over them, but I think, I think there's great power in these last couple of verses. Verse 12, but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, now this seems like a historical throwaway line, but Luke is very intentional. Remember, he's a historian. He wants to anchor his story in real time. We know from extra-biblical sources and from archaeology that Gallio uh, was a Roman senator, uh, brother of the famous writer Seneca, who's known to have been at the uh, post of proconsul in 51 and 52 A.D., exactly the time frame of this story. During this time, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Now, here it is. This is exactly what Paul anticipated and what he dreaded. He's now dragged before the authorities. He's accused of being a religious criminal, and he knows what usually comes next. Stoning, beating, prison, possibly even worse. But Roman law had a process. This is part of what made the Romans famous. The accusers would speak first, bringing their case against the accused. Then the accused would be allowed to make a defense. And then the magistrate would render a decision. Verse 14, but when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, notice, Paul was preparing to defend himself. Paul was a brilliant orator, a brilliant man. Later in Acts, he does offer verbal defense after he's arrested in another situation. Here, he's preparing to fight for his life, but before he can say a word, 
The non-believing pagan politician speaks for him. He says, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see, it to, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. I think this is the second transformational point in this story, and it comes as a surprise. Surprise to us, and I think a shock to the, to the Apostle Paul. Because God uses a pagan, non-believing Roman politician to protect him and the gospel. But remember that dream that Paul had when God promised, I am with you, no one will attack you, I have many people in this city. This is God making good on his promise to Paul. One of those he had in the city was a man named Gallio who didn't even know God was using him for his purposes. The story's not done yet. Verse 17. And they all seized Sosthenes the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Sosthenes here is evidently the prosecuting attorney in the case. He's the one making the case against Paul in front of Gallio. Okay? Paul is about to respond. Gallio steps in and basically just dismisses the case, throws it out. The crowd then turns on Sosthenes. Now, he's their guy. He's the one they put up in front. But since he failed to make the case and it gets thrown out, their rage is so built up, they turn on him and they beat him mercilessly and Gallio just turns a blind eye. He could care less what they do to each other. Now, here's the question. Why does Luke include this little verse, this story about this guy named Sosthenes when it's really not important to the story of the Apostle Paul. Paul's already good. He's been set loose. He's not going to prison. Why tell this story? How many of you remember um, Paul Harvey, the radio personality? Remember listening to Paul Harvey? Remember he would do that little segment sometimes called the rest of the story? A little twist on the end of a story. Usually came after a commercial break. You know, now you know the rest of the story. Where well, does the rest of the story here? Several years later, when Paul was actually all the way in Rome writing letters to churches, one of the letters he wrote was to the church he had left behind in Corinth. It's called 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, here's what we read. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. That's the same guy. Scholars believe that's the same guy. Why else would Paul make sure to mention that name in a letter to the church in Corinth unless they knew who that guy was? And why would Luke give this one verse in chapter 18 of Acts unless he also knew what eventually happened to Sosthenes? It's that guy. How cool is that? Here's Sosthenes, a guy who was so opposed to the gospel that he led the charge to have Paul thrown in the prison or worse, only to end up being beaten himself. Years later, he winds up being one that Paul calls our brother Sosthenes. Wouldn't you like to hear how that story went? Paul knew what it was like to be beaten, thrown in prison. I don't know how he approached Sosthenes, how that story happened. Someday we might know. So what are the takeaways for us from this chapter? First, the gospel reaches Sin City. The gospel gains a foothold in an unlikely place called Corinth. That means the gospel can also reach our city, your city, your sphere, the place where you live, your family, your friend, your place of work, your campus. The gospel can get a foothold. Secondly, we see Priscilla and Aquila added to the team. We don't learn a lot about them quite yet, but God had uniquely prepared them for this time and this place to serve with Paul. Here's a question for us. How has God uniquely prepared you for this time and this place to serve him? Might be your training, your giftedness, your place of work. Might be your experience. Might be your resources. But I believe God has you here for this time and this place for his purposes. Thirdly, God encourages Paul when he's fearful. Friends who will stand with him. He encourages him by the Holy Spirit who comforts him. Have you been on the roller coaster lately? 
Have you been on, the, on sort of the downside of that journey? You feel forgotten and alone. Well, God hasn't forgotten. He sends those who come alongside. He sends his spirit to comfort and encourage. We see that God is sovereign. Even when it seems that Paul is going to fail and is going to go back to prison, he uses a pagan politician to protect Paul and the ministry of the gospel. Finally, we see something that I would call the Sosthenes effect. It's hard to say, but the Sosthenes effect. Is there a Sosthenes in your own life? That is one, if you thought about it, you would think, you know, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think the gospel is going to take root there. Remember, pray, seek the guidance of the Spirit, engage, build a relationship, invite, because you never know when a seed sown, when the seed sown of the gospel is going to spring into life. That's the Sosthenes effect. Bow with me as I close today, please. Lord God, I thank you for this story. I thank you for this, this book of Acts we've been journeying through. And help us not to walk through it like we're walking through a religious museum, but rather to see it like our story. Because we are still living out this story. Because we are your church. It's a story full of surprises. The gospel reaching unlikely places, touching unlikely people. It's a story full of encouragement. Some here this morning need to be encouraged at a down, downturn in their journey. It's a story of transformation. Even Sosthenes, once an enemy to the gospel, becomes a brother. May we be encouraged by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for the benediction? As always, our prayer partners are available down here in front. If there's an issue you'd like to seek prayer for, please join us. We'd love to spend that time with you. And remember, the, uh, the voluntary gift of generosity we want, we want to pass forward to another church to experience uh, God's word in community. The benediction comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Have a great day.